Welcome to another episode of This Catholic Life, conversations about life's ups and downs, big and small, how we do with every situation imaginable, whatever life throws at us, but still manage to be sensible, practical and joyful. Today's show is about building community. It's a conversation about parish life um, in the city, usually, sometimes in the country, but in the city seems to be our experience and the, the difficulties and some joys of trying to build community within a suburban parish. I'm joined today by Father Sam Lynch, who's the parish priest of Summerhill and Lewisham Parish. Is that correct? That's correct. It's great to be here. Good to see you, Pete. Thank you. Um, And we've had conversations like this casually over the years, and uh, I thought it'd be good to actually bring into this um, podcast that kind of conversation. Let's start with the difficulties. The difficulties of um, a suburban parish community is that I mean, I discovered this when I first became a Catholic. I I turned up to Mass. I was very excited to be Catholic. I was in in the new moment, and I was quite excited about meeting all the new Catholics because as a Protestant, you'd go to church, you'd show up, there'd be a community lunch afterwards, you'd talk to people, you'd hang out in Bible studies during the week. Uh, But about five minutes before the Mass had even ended, Catholics started to leave, and then About two minutes after the final blessing, they had left um, and there was about three people left in the car park and I was checking my deodorant to say, do do I, am I that repulsive? Is everyone running away for some reason? (laughs) There's a kind of, there's a difference in culture. It's not just about what goes Mm. on the liturgy. There seems to be a difference in culture. My my brother and I used to joke about this, and we used to call it the "go in peace, slam bolt lock" uh, uh, <laughs> manoeuvre. Uh, or, which... or, or go in peace? No, really, I meant go, go. <laughs> yes, it's it's not true everywhere. Uh, it's it's not true in every parish, but it is a, it is a problem. There is a there is a problem because there is a a rump of Catholics that do um, want to turn up to worship God and, you know, get their mass in. And that's about as much as they want. They, you know, they can be quite hard to engage beyond that. And it's it's kind of funny because um, certainly many years ago, certainly, you know, in the 60s and that sort of thing, I mean, older parishioners at Lewisham tell me about how the parish was their whole social life and how right. everything, everything, that they did, you know, it was very much in, uh, arranged around uh, parish life. Uh, it wasn't was that just because about they were all locals? Church. Yes, it definitely had a lot to do with that. It was definitely right. a we all walk, walk to church kind of an arrangement. That's certainly true. But I mean, I come, I'm in the inner west, and there's a church, you know, every mile. Um, so right. it was set up that way. It was deliberately set up so that everyone could walk, walk to church by right. uh, Cardinal Gilroy. But if they were walking to church and that was their area, it's also likely that those same people were the people they met in their school life or in their various community activities around the traps. It wasn't just the going to mass where they met. That's right. And it's it's this change in culture that um, there's been a broadening out of Australian culture, which is a good thing. It's a positive thing because um, we used to have sectarianism and, um, you know, the the which is the flip side, the bad side of, of a strong uh, Catholic community and people, you know, wanting to socialise together and be together in all kinds of ways. And uh, it, it meant exclusion of those who weren't part of the group, whereas now That's right. or, or if you fell afoul of someone important in that group, you, you were really just on the outer already because you're either in or you're out. Um, yes, that might be true, although, I mean, so, some places, so in Liverpool Parish, where I've been in the past as well, I mean, I don't, I'm not sure anyone knows how many different Catholic groups there are in Liverpool Parish. It might be <laughs> the old joke is, is that the Holy Spirit doesn't know certain things, and that might be one of the things the Holy Spirit, even the Holy Spirit doesn't know. Uh, there's just so many groups in some places, in some of the bigger <laughs> That's parishes. That's a good problem to have, though. It is. It's a great problem to have. So the the movement issue, the mobility issue of our century seems to have been that we, we have motor cars and they had them back then, but the, the whole lifestyle has moved to being mobile. And so instead of perhaps meeting someone else in our suburb it, later in the week or catching up with them in the school, we're unlikely to catch up with people in our parish unless we're very, very one of the very fortunate few who have a 
uh, our work quite close to our home because most of us have to travel quite a distance for work and then all the other things we travel for are quite a distance too. Yes, I I loathe the commute every morning. It's terrible. <laughs> You're one of the few. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well. 15 metres from my presbytery door to the church door, it's just killing me. Yeah, you're not winning over your audience, Father. This is not <laughs> – in Sydney, in Sydney, when I move to my present location and I have an under an hour commute to my, my desk, people were telling me how wonderful this commute is, like to have under yeah. an hour in Sydney. I used to have an hour and a half, and that was about average, I think, and there are some people at my work who travel two, two and a half hours to get to their desk. That's wow, each morning. That's awful. I apologise for being flippant about that. That's terrible. <laughs> but, I mean, you can imagine how someone coming home from work after such a thing, they've spent anywhere between um, three and five hours on public transport, let's say two and five hours in, on public transport. They're just not keen to pop out to the parish, which is maybe, you know, 15 minutes away to, to join in a social gathering. You know, they're just wrecked and mm -hmm. they just want to collapse. I yep. wonder if it's the lack of community is not just about um, our dispersion, our geographical dispersion, but there's there's two more factors that I I think are involved here. One is that we just don't have as much time on our hands anymore. There was a period, perhaps in the 60s, 70s, when the, the it was the heyday of the eight hours, you know, eight hours of work, eight hours of rest, eight hours of sleep. I doubt there's very many people who are actually getting those eight hours of recreation to themselves each each day because it's eaten up by travel or other obligations or often, quite often, work obligations. That, yes. um They're just not getting that kind of spare time. And so really the people in the parish who have the spare time are people who are retired, and even they're quite busy a lot of the time. Oh, yes. Many of our retirees are busier than ever, and largely because I think they're helping um, their children with their grandchildren because – as you say, I mean, life is pressured. Both parents are normally working uh, and they've got, you know, they need the help. They do. And po possibly I mentioned two things. The, the second big one that I've noticed is that a lot of people are travelling to their where they go to Mass. People are developing a kind of a preference for what kind of Mass they'd like to go to. You'll quite often find that people will drive more than a suburb away <laughs> to get to their Mass, shall we say. I confess that I drive anything up to 30 minutes on a Sunday to get to Mass, and I've done that for some time uh, in various places that I've been. Uh, but I'm not the only one. There are some parishes where people drive quite some distance to get there on a Sunday, mm. and that, that makes it a little bit prohibitive when you're trying to organise activities that aren't about the Mass itself. That's true. You actually have to make it something that people really want to come for um, mm. in order to be able to you know, get people to commit to that kind of stuff. And, of course, you know, organisationally, you, you need a certain level of commitment from some, you know, at least a, a, gr a certain group of people or the thing mm. just doesn't, whatever it might be, whatever the activity is, it just doesn't work. It, right. it falls over from want of uh, enough people to keep it running. There's also, I mean, maybe I was just disorganised, but when I was uh, running a very small parish, Lutheran parish of my own, it was really, really beneficial to have just a couple of people local who you could call on when you, when something fell through, you know, when you needed a hand with something. Um, and if your par parish is scattered far and wide, then it's harder to call on people because they have to come quite a distance. That's true, but I don't think I've ever been in a parish where there weren't people like that who were just right. around the corner who were generally involved and engaged and generous enough to help you out if you really needed something. Okay. There was uh, there was um, a storm recently, and um, you know one of the churches uh, had some water ingress, and so we needed to move church to the hall, um, and uh, that was, you know, people people were willing to help with that. That wasn't that wasn't an issue. It was easy enough to get help. So fair enough. It's still it's still true, even though it is true that there are you know there's a good proportion of parishioners in both my churches, both parish churches that I look after, who travel. There's also there's also a good number that are locals as well. Right. Do you think that um, it's possible to build community with um, with people coming from far and wide and from local um, areas, or do you end up having two different communities? Well, you know, I'm still thinking about it. Um, I think 
parishes are different. There are different. Um, you've got you face different circumstances with different parishes. In the area that I'm in, in the inner west, there's you know there's a, a, a demographic decline. The parishes out west, like Liverpool, for example, that I mentioned before, they're just much bigger. I mean, there's just a lot more happening, a lot more people around, a lot more engagement. And there's a lot more families the, out there? Yeah, um, a lot more families who want to come to church. That's, right. that's certainly the case. But there's also, I mean, just the reality of the fact that I have two churches to look after and there's one priest. I mean, I, I can't do six masses a weekend. Um, and so that means that, you know, when that happened, which happened in in my time, um, there were people who missed out. Basically, who you know, in the end, I had to make a choice about which masses to retain and which ones not to. And um, there were people who were who who missed their mass time, and mm. you know, the time that they come to mass, you know, mattered a lot to them. Um, yes, it's something that's habitual. And so they, and also the place, but but the time yep. was is important. So as a result, you just you, your community in some senses diminishes because of that, and then you've got to sort of build up again in the ones that are that are still going. Well, let's let me get a bit controversial here. Um, some of the responses to the plenary council request for feedback, and some things I noticed in some of the German bishops' conferences that they suggested this could be solved by having lay led. Liturgies. So if you had six liturgies in the parishes you had, then if you can only actually show up to four of them as a priest, why not have a couple that are lay-led during the week? Would that solve the problem and keep the community together, so to speak, that was already there on those times? Well, in some places it's been a partial solution. Um, in country areas, like a, a number of my friends are country priests and uh, I, they'll often stay in my presbytery if they come to Sydney for something. And so I'll sort of talk to them about how things are going and what's happening. And if they're looking after, you know, a number of far-flung towns, then that's actually helpful to some degree to to have a communion service or something like that that's led by um, particular people. But unfortunately, there is a tendency for that to go bad, um, that it, it can go actually... Go bad in what way, sorry? Well, it can actually end up that, um, because, I mean, you know, it's not Mass, and the Mass the mass is much more than just a communion service. And, yes, uh, and so it can actually be deformative of people's faith. It actually can change the way they view things and they can come to have a total misunderstanding of what, what yeah. worship is in the Catholic faith. Um, so that is a danger that, that you know, has to be avoided. Yeah. Well, the Lutherans found this when they – practice ends up forming faith. So when they had um, country parishes which couldn't have communion more than once every month or so, uh, the the pastor only got round once a month and they'd have communion, but the rest of the, the weeks they had just sort of a lay-led thing. And then when they finally got to a situation where they were blessed enough to have a minister there each, every week, a lot of them had formed an, an ideology that it was it was irreverent to have communion every week because, you know, they had yeah. kind of built a almost a virtue out of the way they'd done it before. And, yep. you know, it, it can it can be formative in the, in a bad way if we do it that way. Yes, can be deformative. Deformative, yes. Yeah. Um, in the cities, uh, it's a slightly different situation because, as I mentioned, I think I drive 30 minutes through Sydney and I, I, I've i lost count of how many parishes I would drive past in that time. So if I were actually in a state where I suggested that, I, you know, I'm absolutely desperate for mass, I'm not hard up for choices in Sydney. It's not as if I have to drive no. three hours in any direction to find there's a there's a parish at the end of my street, for goodness sake. So it's it's harder to I think argue for that in in a place where we can find an alternative mass not too far away. Oh absolutely. Um but again it can it it tends to be also a somewhat false understanding of community for example. You know um there are there can be attachments to um particular people and particular places that become more important than the faith itself or that, that actually substitute for it. In fact, it can be a problem um, with uh, the RCIA, with people 
becoming Catholics, that if you're not careful in the process, that they can actually feel themselves only a Catholic or only attached to the local church, the particular parish church where they were came into the Catholic faith. And there's research that shows that when they, uh, that many of them drop away from the practice of the faith altogether when they move state, interstate or move cities or something like that, and they can no longer go to the church where they, you know, they entered into the Catholic faith, which just shows you that, you know, well, something's gone wrong with the with the process of right. of forming them in the in the Catholic faith, because they need to, you know, we we should understand that it's the faith at the at the end of the day that matters. But of course, the ex- the opposite extreme of that problem is the problem that we started with, which is that some people <laughs> say, "Well, I don't go to church to talk to people. I go to church <laughs> just to just to worship God." And when I'm done with that, well, I'm done, and now I go. Yeah, um, I, I teach this in one of my biblical classes about the word peace in um, Hebrew. It involves the complete and utter flourishing of human persons. And when we say peace be with you and with your spirit, we're actually committing ourselves to the complete flourishing of all those present. In particular, God is blessing us with his peace. Mm-hmm. But, you know, when you hit the altar rail, you're not just um, having a horizon- horizontal relate, sorry, a, a vertical relationship with God. You're also committing yourself to the, the universal church and and all its members and all its works. There's mm. an aspect of that we can overemphasize and make it too much about community. But as you were talking, I was just thinking, if I'm really like the local community and we can only have mass, you know, once every, every so often, then I can, there's nothing stopping me from meeting with them. You know, I can yep. play, you know, bridge or bingo or, or bowls or something. You know, there's no actual prohibition for my social life. But we seem to be running two things together here, and this was this was a, what was interesting yes. to me about Catholics. When I was a Lutheran, you'd have the Eucharistic service, then you would have Bible study, then you would have lunch. You know, everything was kind of there, but it was yep. all different. Sure, and that and that can be part of the problem too with styles of liturgy too. For example, so in some places that have had a particular, you know kind of um, approach by the by the pastor in the past you know people will would have complained to me well you know you're not you're, you're not um, greeting us at the beginning and all this sort of stuff and you're not you know um, even though that afterwards and before mass I might be greeting people and talking to them and afterwards I'm certainly you know hanging out with them and having morning teas and, and being uh, make myself available to chat to people and so forth but during the mass, I just follow what's in the prayer book. I don't. I don't actually, um, you know, start talking about the football scores or what have you, um, which some priests do and some priests have, as a kind of a, like I don't know. Maybe they think it's an icebreaker or or what it is. But but it actually um, it means that some people think that well, you know, you're just not being human if you if you're not doing that in the mass. But or I, that the personal my, relationship with the priest is more important than what's going on in the mass. Yeah, that that could be it. I think it's just muddying the two things together. And right. I've tried to sort of say to people, yeah, but you know, we're not we're not there to have a cup of tea. We're there to do the mass. So we do the mass, and then we have and a, cup a cup of tea, of and then tea we, afterwards. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you know, and I mean, this happened once um, when someone wanted to sing happy birthday to one of the community members who had a significant birthday during mass. And, um, you know, and I said, well, can we, I mean, I knew that we were all about to go outside after the final blessing to have a birthday cake. Well, can't we do that then? You know, sort of said, is no, the appropriate let's do that time then. to sing. <laughs> which, which is the appropriate time to sing. But the thing is, is that um, when you muddy all of that up and you mush it all together, it actually, it actually puts off a number of people. There are it some does. people who who actually really like that, you know, they or they come to like it or they come to expect it and 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 mm. so forth, and they want that blurring of the lines between, if you like, formal worship and fellowship. Um, yeah. But um, but then there's a whole lot of others, and they're often the ones that don't hang around after after mass, who 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 just really find that awkward and unpleasant, and they just don't want a part of that. Even if you joined a Rotary Club or a Lions Club or a Sports Club, um, I've I've been part of a sports club before. There's there's a time for the formal meeting where things have to be done according to a particular formulas, and then there's the time for actually hanging out and joking around and and singing songs and mucking around. 
And some um, people really like that, but the problem is is that there's a lot of others, uh, and often they're the ones that you know you were referring to earlier that might leave early. Uh, they're very discomforted by it, actually, and uh, they don't like that blending of worship hmm. as such and fellowship. They want to keep them separate. Our local priest, um, well, he's not there now, but our local priest used to ask all the children to stand on the pews and have everyone applaud them every single Mass. Now, hmm. he thought it was a beautiful gesture of welcome to the children, and, and many some other families felt the, the same, that they were very welcoming of it, but my children actually refused to ever go to that church again. I couldn't actually get them into the mass yep. anymore because they were so humiliated and sh and That's right. utterly just terrified of being exposed in this way that they just didn't want to do mm. it. And there were other families who've said the same and gone elsewhere. Now, as we said, there's nothing wrong with having these activities but just confusing them. So perhaps we need to come back to that original thing, that what Catholics seem to be trying to do is run everything that they want in a community into the mass, which isn't what the mass is for. And no. so what we perhaps, rather than argue with them about what goes on in the mass, is simply just provide these opportunities outside of mass. Isn't that the solution? It's half the solution. The other half of the solution is to insist gently but firmly and to sort of push things more and more in, in the direction of actually celebrating mass and respecting the uh, that it is what it is and just doing mass and not inserting into mass a whole lot of extraneous things uh and there is a kind of it's difficult with um it's it's part of the problem has arisen i think because of the fact that we since vatican II, celebrate in the vernacular in the in the local language so that formality that was natural when um you just did the ritual that was laid down in the books has has broken down to some degree, because you're speaking to people in a, in English in the in the local language, and so you you do have this tendency to kind of want to well, not quite ham it up, but but sort of uh, there is a there is a kind of a, a logic to it, or a, a feeling that you've got to you've got to. Um, Are you suggesting that familiarity breeds contempt? Uh, I think that's a bit harsh. I I, I wouldn't say contempt. I just say right. that. I just say that it's a blurring of the lines and it's something that as a celebrant of the liturgy, you, you just have to be really conscious of that um, uh, there's a psychological sort of pressure when you're standing in front of a room full of people and facing them all and so forth at times to want to crack a joke or to, to you know, in a sense, make yourself popular with, yep. with people. Make it a performance. Um, make it a performance and and it yeah. isn't a performance and and you've got to you've got to resist that temptation yeah what helps is if you've got a whole team of people altar servers and various ministers and music ministers and all that who are all working with you to produce um the liturgy according to you know the books and yep. the, the the requirements so making it a making it a team effort and making it a more formal thing by structuring it that way and giving it structure um, just helps you to keep, keep on the... I'm going to come back to the... a point that you said before about Latin. I, I'm uh, Maybe it's a bit controversial, but I actually think in some ways having the liturgy just in Latin actually removes um, the people from it too far in that there are a few people who get right into the mass. They get right into it. They learn the Latin phrases. They can completely understand it. They're very much alongside it. And it being in the Latin draws them into another world kind of thing, into the more sacred sort of understanding. But um, for those people, and I have to say, realistically, if we're talking about an ordinary parish in Sydney, you wouldn't find a high percentage of people who are that keen to get, you know, to get into it, into the foreign language. Putting it in another language is going to simply just, they're just going to rock, switch off. They're just not going to engage. Whereas if it's in English, they can actually hear the words and there's more chance of them engaging with the formality of the liturgy. And if, if you know, you're saying things about God and his majesty and they can't help but respond to those things if they're listening at all. Maybe that's a bit controversial, but I, I, I'm a, a fan of uh, the vernacular to a certain extent that it brings people in who, who we're not, in an era now where people learn Latin in high school, we're not in an era where anyone really has access to this unless they've gone to a special uh, sort of educational effort. 
Well, the church has been through this, of course, before, because the, the liturgy was originally celebrated in Greek, and it was mm. originally celebrated in Greek because it was the common language of the Roman Empire, which was the inheritor of the Empire of Alexander the Great. And then, of course, there was this evil council or something at some point, and they decided that they were going to <laughs> suddenly uh, burst into Latin because now everyone new latin and then centuries passed and and the romance languages evolved and they moved away from latin and latin became a purely uh, liturgical and scholarly language and then along comes vatican ii and says you know what might not be a bad idea to have liturgy in the vernacular um, which has one problem with it that i think is a problem and and that is well there might be others but but one problem that occurs to me is is that whereas in the past you in those times Latin actually was or Greek actually was the language that everyone understood all over the whole of Europe. Yes. Whereas yeah. now we don't actually I mean, even English isn't quite that. It's not it's no. not actually the lingua franca of the whole world, which I think is unfortunate because it means like in Sydney, for example, we necessarily must have, you know, pe people like in my church at Lewisham, we have a Portuguese community, right? And they're mm. just not comfortable celebrating mass any other way than in Portuguese. Um, whereas in the past, they might have just integrated because, well, in Portugal, they celebrate the Mass in Latin, and in Australia, we celebrate the Mass in Latin. It's exactly the same ceremony. It's exactly the same. The only thing that's different might be the, the homily. Right. So another thing about the liturgy that's really important to understand is, is that uh, you talked about at the altar rails, there's this horizontal element, the fact that we are with people, and we're also, you know, there's a vertical element. We're actually worshipping God. Well, the problem is, is that the horizontal can take over because we can see the people next to us. Um, we can see the people that we're with. We can't see God. And so that's, that's the thing that the liturgy has to work harder to make present the invisible to us, to make, to make the mystical um, and the transcendent something that we can, in a sense, touch and feel and taste and see. Okay. And I have to say that um, good, good liturgy, good singing, good... Um uh, homilies, um, reverent masses help us in that direction. But let, let's, we were about done with time. So let's get some um, practical uh, tips down. One practical tip is to learn people's names. I mean, it seems like a very small thing, but I mean, I must have been going to mass for like two, three years in some parishes. I smile and nod and, and shake someone's hand and say hello to them every week, but I don't even know their name because it's now it's embarrassing to ask them their name after we've been in the same space for so long. Um, and this kind of social awkwardness takes over. And when they're not at mass, then I wonder, oh, where's so-and-so? And where's the guy who used to sit in front of us all that time? I wish I knew where he lived or something I could drop a card or ask if they're okay um, or, you know, help out in some way. Just little things like that, little connections that we make. I mean, we gave a whole bunch of parishioners who sat around us Christmas cards during a Mass once just because it was Christmas and we thought, oh, we'll just reach out. And it actually started conversations. It started a kind of connection with them outside of the Mass, which was an interesting thing. I didn't think it would. Yeah, that's a top idea. The activities that you need to do to sort of build community, there are, you, you're right, there's got to be some activities outside of just doing mass. I mean, that's the thing. But but that's the pastoral struggle today is is actually getting people invested in them and actually getting them committed to them and wanting to do them. And that's 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 the trick. It's um it it's is. a constant juggling act to make that work. And I guess the question is then is uh is it because we're pro providing activities which don't actually suit them or don't attract them? Because it's it would be quite a big thing to say people just don't want community anymore. I think they do. Maybe they don't have time for it anymore. That's one issue. But it may be the act, our activities just aren't the sort that they're they're interested in investing in. Look, I'm going to be controversial now, and I'm going to say <laughs> that I think that part of the whole problem has been on the opposite side, and that is, is that what I've seen at Lewisham. Uh, since, you know, really investing in particularly in sacred music, uh, the, the church has been restored, we, we have a very traditional kind of liturgy, 
I find that people and um, you know, people stay after mass to talk to one another for quite some time. You don't get the whole, you know, three minutes after the end of mass, everyone's gone syndrome at Lewisham. Um, people are actually keen to meet and talk to one another, and I think it's it's because they have they know they have something in common. They enjoy being together to worship God in that way. They they realize well actually we have something in common here and so as a result they're, they're actually keener to hang around and talk now i think we need to leverage that and i had a whole lot of plans which sadly covid destroyed uh, uh but postponed, always next shall year we say, postponed <laughs> <laughs> well probably on that note we probably need to um open it up to our listeners if you have ideas about building parish community before, after, during the week, in all kinds of ways, uh, feel free to hit us up with them, uh, post us, and we might even make it into another show discussing the various ideas you bring up. But that's all for this week's podcast. If today's discussion got you thinking or arguing with your podcast advice, let us know. Send us your ideas. Send us your, what you're doing in your parish community, which is a great idea we can share with others. You can buy into the conversation on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or Discord, and find all the links in our show notes or on our website. Um, write us a review too while you're there. Remember, this is a uniquely Australian Catholic podcast, and we think that's an idea worth getting behind. So tell your friends. We'll be back next week, but that's all for now. Thank you for listening to This Catholic Life.